Are you still running Windows XP? Are you still working with Office 2007? Is Microsoft Internet Explorer still your organization's only whitelisted browser? And is your machine a 7 gigabyte hard drive desktop with USB ports in the back of a tower buried so far underneath your desk that you'll rupture a disk trying to plug in a flash drive? See what I mean? Technology can change 20-fold in a 15-year span. And your resume needs to portray somebody that's up to date and with the times. Now, streaming at you in living color from the far reaches of podcast land, America's white collar wise guy, the career conciliary. What do you hear? What do you say? Welcome to installment number five of the career conciliary podcast. You are no frills, no BS forum for navigating the corporate job scene. Jimmy here with you once again for what we hope to be a highly informative and engaging half an hour or so. Today, we will conclude our resume writing series by focus on what I like to say as making it speak, making the resume say what we want to say without saying anything at all. After all, it's just a document with words. We'll start off spending some time on the all important topic of verbs on your resume, very important. We'll talk about verbs and how to use them. From there, we'll get into what to include and what to omit from your resume, since, as you're well aware by now, a resume is not an autobiography. And finally, we'll finish at what I call the summit of resume writing, as we'll discuss the mythical power of keywords and how to use them. A lot to do today. So, if you're ready, podcast land, let's get it. You guys want to know the hallmark of a terrible resume, an absolute dead giveaway that you have no idea what you're doing in writing one? I'll tell you, bad verb usage. That's it. And bad grammar in general is a huge no-no when it comes to resumes. But as they say, if you ain't got the right verbs, then you ain't getting the right gerb. Who says that? Somebody out there, I'm sure. It may seem superficial. And you yourself may gloss over verbs when you're reading a resume, when you're reading any document. After all, who's paid attention to the parts of speech since fourth grade English, right? Verb. Who uses that word in their everyday diction? Not you. Not me. But think about it. What is a verb? If you think back to what you learned in fourth grade, it's the part of speech that signifies an action. You yourself as the implied subject doing something, taking some kind of action. That is a verb. And the recruiter, robot, international AI spy, whoever or whatever it happens to be that's reading your resume has nothing else to judge you off of except, you guessed it, these actions, these verbs that you claim to have taken throughout your years of experience. Now, for starters, when it comes to verbs, as a best practice, every single entry you make anywhere on your resume where you're talking about your professional experience should absolutely begin with the verb. The very first word in whatever heading, subheading, bullet point it happens to be begins with a verb. And you're also going to want to do your best to avoid overusing the same verb. Here's a story for you. And this actually happened. Back in sixth grade, I remember one time we had to write an essay. And it wasn't a terribly wrong essay. I think it was a page or two. But the condition, the catch was... We weren't allowed to start any two sentences with the same word. Couldn't use the same word more than once to begin a sentence. And yes, Mr. Williams actually did check the whole damn thing. Sick individual he was. Sick and twisted. Absolute torture on a 12-year-old's vocabulary. But it was an exercise that really, really forced you to dig deep. And without that kind of cruel and unusable training that I endured, who knows? Maybe I never become a resume writer. Maybe I never start this podcast. Maybe I never am who I am today. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that you have to take it to that extreme. In fact, I would discourage you from doing so. It's not necessary to go to that great length to avoid using the same word twice. I'm not, I'm not suggesting that's what you actually do. 
but do your best to change up the language as you go through your resume. What this also does is this forces you to think about the kinds of tasks you did and how you're slanting your experience in different ways. For example, would you say that you analyzed reports from different data outputs, or would you rather spin it as manage the analytics from quantitative and qualitative inputs to develop game-changing insights? You tell me. Now, when you're using verbs, what you'll want to do is you'll want to give some consideration to the relationship they have with the experience that you're trying to describe. Any job or experience of any kind, regardless of what it is that you're not currently doing at this point in time on the resume, should be denoted by past tense verbs. Planned, coordinated, managed, supervised, achieved, all ending in ED to indicate past tense, and on we go. You get it. Can anybody guess what I'm going to say next? That's right. Whatever work assignments, regardless of what they are, that you're presently involved with at the point in time when you're submitting your resume or applying for a job, get a, you guessed it, present tense verb. Produce, analyze, create, develop, blah, 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 and rah, rah, rah. Anything that you're currently doing should be stated in the present form. Folks, I see people botch this all the time. It's right up there on like the top five big resume faux pas no-nos that I see happen constantly. Using inconsistent verb tenses, failing to start sentences with verbs at all, and the number one thing that really grinds my gears, using first person. Yes, the whole world, you hear this cliche all the time growing up, tells you never assume because then you make an ass out of you, me, and Mr. McGee. We've heard it. But if you're applying for a job, if it's your name that's at the top of the resume in big, beautiful, size 24 bold, then guess what? The company knows that you, indeed, are the implied subject of every subsequent word on that document. And they don't need your annoying one-letter word reminders 50 more times. I promise. You want my opinion? Using I is just plain tacky. And to give you some wisdom from an esteemed professor and psychologist that I once studied under back in school, don't do that. Now listen up, because this final point on verbs is very important. In this modern age, today's modern age of technological cray-cray, the resume that you have is little more than the weapon you use to outsmart the AI of the company that you're applying to and get your name in the door. Remember from earlier in the series that in most cases, especially when you're applying to a decent sized company, an AI robot gatekeeper within the company's ATS is the first line of defense that your resume encounters on its way to the employer and to the eventual hiring manager. And look, I'm going to be very candid and frank here. On a personal note, hearing myself say these words makes me realize what an absolute friggin' tragedy it is that trying to keep money in our pockets has come to this, trying to outsmart robots for a chance at a job interview. What the hell is that? So look, I'm totally on the side of the job seeker here. But if we want to work for a corporation, which we all do, right? That's why we're listening to this podcast. And if we're applying to that job in the conventional way by answering an online job posting, there is nothing that we can do anytime soon to change this process at all. So therefore, we are forced to play along with these games, but to do so in the most intelligent, clever, and shrewd way possible. And having the right verbs on your resume is absolutely critical when it comes to this. And the right verbs can actually be a game changer when it comes to keywords, buzzwords, or any other name you want to use for those quote unquote magic words that help get us noticed by the employer. Whatever words tend to outsmart the AI, tend to light up on the screen, tend to get us the email, get us the phone call, the ones that recruiters are looking for. Verbs can very well be those words. For example, if you're applying to be a teacher, you can bet dollars to donuts that your potential employer is going to be expecting to see words like taught, facilitated, instructed, led, moderated, and on we go. And look, 
If you're starting to get sloppy and don't begin each entry with a lucid, intelligent, well-thought-out verb, you are missing golden, golden opportunities to get picked up by the company's algorithms. Anybody catch the movie reference on that one? Go back and listen again if you want. We're going to get more into keywords later. But for now, just know that the verbs you choose to use are crucial in the perpetual cat and mouse game that applying for a job has become. And using the right verbs can make all the difference at the end of the day. So let's now make believe that we're all a bunch of human thesauruses and we have a nice diverse array of verbs that would impress Shakespeare himself. At this point, if you've been following the series and you've put everything into action, just as we've laid out, you've got yourself a pretty solid resume. So what's the final piece? The whipped cream and maraschino cherry on top of the thing? Crafting the narrative by strategically deciding what and what not to include. As with all aspects of resume writing, to drive home this point once again, there is no panacea here. There is no absolute, without a doubt, hard and fast rule to follow on this. But as a rule of thumb, I will venture as far as to make this bold statement. In general, any experience that's more than 15 years old probably doesn't belong on your resume anymore. The only exception here would be formal education. Your degrees and diplomas always stay. Not even certifications. This, in my opinion, applies only to degrees and diplomas. Why 15 years? What's so magical about 15 years? Well, think about it. Out there in Kingdom Corporatopia, what processes do you know that haven't changed at all since 2008? I sit here speaking to you in 2023. 15 years ago was 2008. Can you think of a single process out there in the corporate world that hasn't changed since then? Are you still running Windows XP? Are you still working with Office 2007? Is Microsoft Internet Explorer still your organization's only whitelisted browser? And is your machine a 7 gigabyte hard drive desktop with USB ports in the back of a tower buried so far underneath your desk that you'll rupture a disk trying to plug in a flash drive? See what I mean? Technology can change 20-fold in a 15-year span. And your resume needs to portray somebody that's up to date and with the times. Not somebody still listening to an iPod mini on speakers from Radio Shack. Now, of course, there's always going to be legacy processes and age-old wisdom that transcends this, this magic 15-year rule. Don't get me wrong. But in a modern corporate setting, in most cases, 2008 is 2000 late. And while some of the logic and high-level principles might stand the test of time, general rules of accepted behavior, accepted things that work, laws of physics, laws of gravity, things like that, if you got to go 15-plus years back to try to make yourself competitive, it's going to seem like you're grasping at straws, and the organizations you're applying to are going to start wondering, why are they going back so far? Why do they got to reach that deep in their pocket to try to make a competitive run at this job? And more depressing news for you on this topic. What you've heard is true. Companies do, in many cases, prefer to hire somebody a little bit younger. And it's good business when you think about it. The average employee's market value, in terms of salary, tends to go up over time, right? You get raises every year. Your life expenses tend to go up. In general, I mean, if you look at the data, the salary of the average person, it tends to be a steady climb up as the years go on. And look, you really can't blame these corporations for wanting the most knowledge and experience and skills they can get for the lowest possible price. It's good, sound business. And if it comes down to the 30-year-old versus the 50-year-old as the two final candidates in the running for a job, all other things being equal, all other variables controlled for, what's the deal breaker? Usually, salary. Odds are the 30-year-old is willing to work for a few bucks less and to an organization on a tight budget that can make all the difference in who gets the offer. And folks, this is not discrimination on account of age. That's not what this is. The 50-year-old might be a fine candidate, might have all the right things going for him. It's strictly a dollars and cents thing. 
And eventually, yes, the company will know your age. If you make it into the late rounds of the interview process, and sometimes even earlier than that, eventually you're going to have to fill out an official application. You're going to have to provide your social. You're going to have to provide your birthday. You're going to have to provide some PII, as they say, personally identifiable information. And when you're asked to do that, you should absolutely always be truthful. No exceptions. If you misrepresent yourself when it comes to that, that's fraud. That's illegal. Don't do that. But if you are a seasoned veteran in the workforce and you're worried about losing out to somebody who's maybe a little bit younger, maybe isn't looking for as high of a salary as you, the best thing you can do is to conveniently exclude any experience that you have on your resume that's more than 15 years old. And a good company, a good recruiter on the other end, it's going to actually work in your favor when it comes to what they think. Because what it's going to do is it's going to give the impression that you've kept current and live on the cutting edge within your field of expertise. If you've made it a point to only focus on the last 15 years, on only the knowledge and technology that's the most relevant, and you've really crafted your resume to speak to that, and you've played the hell out of that, recruiters and hiring managers and whoever it happens to be on the other end reading your resume, they're going to notice that, and that's going to stand out to them. There might be other hints on your resume, maybe the year you graduated school, things like that, that may give away your age. But honestly, if you're worried about losing out to somebody else who may be willing to work for a few dollars less, focusing on the most recent relevant things within that 15-year window is a, will give you a huge advantage. And this kind of brings us into the art of being crafty on a resume. And only including experience from the previous 15 years is only scratching the surface with it. There's a lot more to it. And what should and should not go on your resume can depend only on about 46,897 factors. There's a lot of variables to it. And a lot of it's going to depend on your situation and what's going on with you in your job search, where you're at in life, a whole slew of things. But in general, regardless of what's going on, you'll want to only include on your resume what is absolutely critical to the job that you're applying for. And the good news is that this actually gets easier the more experience that you have under your belt. Think about it. The senior buyer with 20 years of experience has a whole lot more to pick and choose from than the vendor coordinator who just graduated last year. Granted, when it's all you've got, Go with what you've got. Don't get me wrong. But as you gain experience, be very mindful of what you choose to include on a resume. Another example, let's say that you're shifting focus. You've worked throughout your career in various supply chain roles, and you decide that you really, really, really liked raw materials procurement, and now you want to specialize. Is focusing on the 18 months that you spent as a transportation coordinator really going to help your case all that much if you want to go into raw materials? I'll leave it to you. But these are the kinds of things you want to be thinking about. Just remember, whatever you choose to include, whatever you choose to omit, make sure that you follow all the guidelines we've covered throughout this series. Use the right formats. Be consistent. Be honest. Use the right language. Make it look nice and professional. All that good stuff. Being creative like this on a resume, strategically choosing what you include, what you don't, slanting things a certain way, kind of being a salesman about it, that only works once the fundamentals are mechanically sound. And if you're not careful, what begins as a hot mess becomes a blazing dumpster fire in no time at all. And now, having spent the last four episodes of this series slowly climbing up Mount Resume, learning all the ins and outs, learning what works and what doesn't, learning what's hot and what's not, we finally reached the summit, the critical art of managing keywords. Not every resume writer would put this at the top of their mountain, but there are very, very legitimate reasons why I've chosen to do so. As we've covered, the average person, when applying for a job, this day and age, uploads their resume into the applicant tracking portal of whatever 
organization they're applying with. And once that happens, it becomes the rise of the machines. The AI robots scan your resume for the right stuff. And we, as mere humans, have no idea what the right stuff is. The company has all the power here. They can program their ATS to look for pretty much anything they want. Once the software processes your application, it's going to actually rank you based on how much of a match your profile is compared to the criteria they have on their hidden agenda. And from there, your fate is in the hands of Skynet. And Schwarzenegger is not going to show up and save you at the last minute. So how in God's name are we supposed to know what the right keywords are that these companies are looking for? No, put away the crystal ball, put away the tarot cards, put away the incense, because organizations literally give us the answer word for word in the job description. For the most part, the job posting gives us a fairly detailed summary of all the tasks, requirements, and responsibilities of the job. It should. Most of them tell you literally everything you need to know spelled out for you word for word. And if it doesn't, then you probably shouldn't be applying for that job. Here's a little public service announcement for you. Ready? A poorly written or excessively vague job description is a colossal, colossal, tremendous red flag about the kind of organization you're applying to. There are organizations out there that do this. They pull the old bait and switch after you apply. What they do is they usually lure you in with something that either sounds too good to be true or is full of cannoli cream, chocolate sprinkles, or some other kind of fluffy BS that distracts you from what they're really up to, what they really got going on. Unlimited income, make your own schedule, all this kind of stuff, telling you nothing about what you're actually going to be doing all day. And if you read the job posting after giving it a thorough examination and you still aren't sure what you'd actually be doing for a living, as Pink Floyd tells us, run like hell. But let's assume that the job description that you're working with is legitimate. And most of them are. It's only a couple of bad actors, only a few outliers that this kind of extreme situation really applies to. If that's the case, if you're working with something that's good and legitimate, the answers to the keyword riddle are literally right there in front of your face. Let's say you work in finance. In almost any finance-related job, you're going to see words pop up like cost, budget, forecast, simulation, profit, calculation, almost anything that deals with money and those dollar-dollar bills that we all love. And guess what? Your resume should be stuffed to the gills with words like this. But don't make assumptions. Don't just assume because you apply to one finance job that your application to another finance job is going to be a carbon copy of the previous one. Not the case. What you're going to have to do, and as much as you may not want to hear this, you are going to have to read the entire job description and look for words that pop up over and over again. Study the patterns. Take a close look. Really analyze it. Because certain companies have their own jargon for things. And that particular word, that jargon buzzword, may or may not be the same as a term that you're already familiar with. But if you use the language, the verbiage, the jargon of the company that you're applying to, if you kind of speak their lingo a little bit, that could be what makes the difference in your application getting noticed. Here's what you do. As you're reading through the job posting, Jot down the words that seem to be aligning with the major focus of the role, the main crux of the function you'll be performing in whatever job it is. And as you read through, these words are going to be easy to spot because you'll see them pop up again and again and again. You'll see them multiple times throughout just about every job posting that you're working with. And some good news. This gets easier and easier the more jobs that you apply to. It can be a little tough for the first three or four, but once you've gone through the rigmarole a couple of times, it gets easier. Because think about it. There's only so many words in the English language that can represent the concepts relating to the kind of work you're going to be doing. So once you've done this, even in the course of an afternoon or for at least for the course of a couple of days, this will become second nature in almost no time. Next, pay close attention here because this is the part where I see most job applicants go horribly wrong. Those keywords that you just dug up, 
need to actually go on your resume. And this has some implications. Yes, for as much as you may not want to hear it, you will need to customize your resume, at least to some extent, for every job that you apply to. And there are ways of making this process a little bit more efficient. There are certain, I don't want to use the word shortcuts, but certain things you can do to make it a little bit less aggravating and less painful on yourself. But if you do nothing else, what you have to do is to at least make sure that the top five to seven keywords that you've identified in your search show up on your resume multiple times. And look, there's no magic number for how many times a keyword has to appear. Use your best judgment and also make sure that these keywords are evenly distributed throughout the document. Don't throw them all right in the beginning and don't cram them all in at the very end in the last couple of sentences. It just looks terrible and does not accomplish what you set out to do. And it also makes it very obvious that that's what you were up to. One thing I always did personally, back when I was on the job market myself, was I used to use the old control F function on my resume. And it's not control find. You know, I hear a lot of people out there in the corporate kingdom saying control find. Guys, find is the function within Microsoft Word that allows you to look for text in your document. Control F is the keyboard shortcut. It's not control find. Man, that one always really got to me. But that's a sidebar. Anyway, call it what you will. I always used to use the Microsoft Word find function. However you access it, the long way, the keyboard shortcut way, whatever you choose to do, that find function I used to search all my keywords throughout the document. Makes it very easy. Microsoft Word actually highlights the words that you searched for using that function. It highlights them in blinding yellow highlight. And it tells you in big, bold characters, might I add, how many times a particular word appears throughout your document and even where on the page it pops up. It spoon feeds you all the information. It gives you a really, really nice visual. All the keywords are going to show up in yellow, the words that you search for anyway. They're going to show up in yellow. You're going to see exactly where they are in your document, and you're even going to get a nice numeric figure to look at to tell you how many times you used it. So if after doing all this, if you're underwhelmed at what you see, then you probably have some work to do to get some more keywords into your document and place them in the place they need to be. And a warning to you, please heed this warning. Do not just try throwing random keywords on your resume completely out of context as a way of hacking the process. I've seen people add headers and footers just for that purpose. What I've seen them do, and again, I don't want to give anybody any bright ideas here, but I've seen people add headers and footers and put white text so that they blend in so that you can't see it and just put all kinds of legitimate keywords, but just throw them in there. No spaces separating them, just really, really ugly thinking, oh, okay, the ATS will certainly pick this up. So in that mode of thinking, they throw all kinds of gobbledygook word salad in there with expired dressing thinking that they're going to game the ATS somehow and get a call from a recruiter. And folks, guess what? The companies that you're applying to are way ahead of you on this. They're not stupid. You got a lot of really smart people working for them and a lot of really smart people that program the ATS to look for what they want to look for. And any applicant tracking portal worth its salt can sniff that garbage out a mile away. It's the oldest trick in the very young book of ATS gaming. The main point here, guys, do the work. Take the extra 15 minutes and reword the entries on your resume to include the right keywords in a grammatically sound and organized way. You want to watch Netflix, you want to do streaming, you want to go zone out on YouTube, it can wait the extra 15 minutes. Take your time and do the work right. You want everything to look and sound natural while containing all the secret code words that it needs to have. And I promise, it gets easier the more you do it. You'll eventually get all this worked into a system and it'll become part of your routine and you'll be sitting here right along with me scoffing at all the lazy Stacys and Sly Clydes who tried taking cute shortcuts like this. Remember, any job worth having is worth doing the work for. My friends, my brethren, my listeners, my people, there you have it. 
the conciliary crash course on resume writing is now complete. Have we covered every single aspect of resume writing? Not even close. There are entire cases of things I didn't touch on. I admit to it fully. Why? Number one, I don't want to make 97 episodes all about resumes. I could, and I'm sure there are shows out there that do. But number one, that would be extremely boring, get extremely dry. And I truly believe that what we've covered in these five episodes gives you a nice foundation to work from. My opinion, I really think this is as complicated as a resume needs to be. Because corporatopians tend to have a way of trying to make everything perfect, obsessing over details and spending time going down rabbit holes with no oxygen, senseless. And that's not what this show is. You know, five episodes in now, you should have a pretty good sense of what this is. It's practical advice. I give you what works and what you need. Nothing extra or unnecessary. And in my 15 plus years of doing this stuff, I can confidently say that if you follow this path, and if you follow the recommendations that we've laid out here, you will be a resume Rambo out there on the job market. And if you need visuals to help you conceptualize all this, again, I've said it before, I know the spoken word really doesn't do resume writing a whole lot of justice. So if you want visuals, you got my website, you're going to get the URL at the end of the show. It's got a whole bunch of samples and visual aids to help you out. And if that's not enough, and you really want some personalized feedback, that can also be arranged. Hit up the website and get in touch with me. I'd be happy to take a look and point you in the right direction. So now, folks, we end our resume series with today's conciliary call to action. Today, we learned how to make the resume speak. And it all starts with picking the right verbs. Every single entry on your resume should begin with a verb. And change them up. Don't keep using the same ones over and over again. See this as an opportunity to expand your vocabulary. Also, keep your verb tenses consistent with respect to pre and post tense. It's going to vary based on your situation. And these verbs that we speak of many, many times double as those magic, all-powerful keywords that we talked about. So be sure to reference your word bank full of all those key words that you've identified as a possible source of good, solid verbs to use. Keep that on hand. Keep it handy. Refer to it. You're going to be using it a lot. In today's Sermon on the Mic, we also learned about what to include and what to omit from your resume. More than 15 years old? Get it out of the fold. Technology evolves way too much in that long of a time, and you're going to look jaded and outdated if you've got stuff on there that's a decade and a half old. Also, only include what is absolutely germane to the job you're applying for. You like that? Germane. That's your vocab word of the day. Once you have even just a few years of experience under your belt, you'll have enough corporate baggage, more than enough to work with, to pick, choose, and schmooze the content you include. But no matter what you choose to put on your resume or how you spin it in your narrative, Whatever you do, be consistent. Make sure that you follow all the guidelines we've covered throughout the entirety of this resume series. This whole series was meant to build on one another. So make sure you're keeping it all with you and you're keeping it all straight as you're writing your document. And finally, even if everything else I've shared with you has gone out the six-story window, make keywords on your resume the number one priority. The best part of this there's no guesswork. The organization you're applying to literally tells you exactly what they are in the job posting. It's like taking an exam and having the answer sheet right in front of you. Think of how beneficial that would have been back when we were in school. Can you imagine what you would have done to have that capability? Well, guess what? When you're applying for a job, you literally do. Every single time, if there's a job posting, you got the answer sheet in front of you. So read it closely and identify the words that are central to the job that seem to be repeated over and over. Then you jot them down somewhere you can reference them easily, however you choose to do that, and then weave them strategically throughout your resume. Make sure they're distributed nicely and appear several times each. No slick business here. Do the work and do it right. It'll pay off when you finally get that phone call. 
Sadly, folks, that's all the time we have for today. But have no fears and shed no tears, because I'll be back with a new episode every week. As they say in the industry, no listeners, no show. So do me a favor and stay loyal. As the new guy, I'd love to know how I'm doing, so if you find any value in my content, please, please, please leave me a nice review, tell all your friends about it, and don't forget to like, subscribe, and follow on whatever platform you use to get your podcasts. And beyond the confines of your headphones, speakers, TV screen, or any other crazy contraption with the ability to stream audio, I also provide one-on-one career assistance. So visit my website at career-conciliary.net to learn more about me, book me for one-on-one coaching, or explore some of the other career services that I offer. And to all of you out there in podcast land, remember this, who's the boss in your career? You. Nobody else.